Who does Jesus think about most? Is it the people who follow him best? The ones who show up to church most often? Maybe the folks who give the most money or serve the most uh, with their time? Actually, it's, it's the people who don't do any of that. And on today's episode, I'm gonna show you why. Welcome to Journey at Home. Whether it's your first time or your hundredth time tuning in, we're glad you're here, and we hope this inspires you to follow Jesus and to live a better life. That is our goal, so do me a favor, hit that subscribe button and that bell for notifications, because when you do that, it helps spread this content to more people, make it accessible for more folks. And now, let's get started. Here is the easiest question you're gonna ever answer. Who do you think about most? Well, you the answer is you, right? You think about you the most, I think about me the most. Just follow the trail of our thoughts or our money or our words or our actions. Everything comes right back to me and right back to you, which makes it a bit challenging for those of us who follow Jesus because he made it clear life's not about me or you. So let me flip this. Who do you think about least? Well, the people least like you and farthest from you. Unless you're trying to get the attention of somebody who has no interest in you so that they'll fall in love with you and then you think about them a lot. But other than that, this is how we all think, right? It's not how Jesus described our Heavenly Father, though. Jesus said there's more rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents, one sinner who's wandered away from God, one person who is lost relationally from their Heavenly Father than over 99 people who already have a relationship with God. In other words, God's focus is first and foremost on those who are far, not those who are found. Now that is a counterintuitive way of thinking that needs to become part of our way of thinking if we want to follow Jesus. So in this series, we're exploring why the first followers of Jesus were called followers of the way and what it means to follow that way today. See, the earliest followers of Jesus, they weren't known first and foremost for any set of religious beliefs. They were identifiable and distinguishable to others by a way of living that Jesus introduced into the world. So today we're going to begin discovering some of the specific core behaviors of people who follow the way. Now, if you're a Christian and you call this your church home, one of the things you need to know is this series is like an internal evaluation to help you see whether these behaviors are true for you. That these are behaviors that are, we want to be core to who we are at Journey. But they can only be true for our church collectively to the extent that they're true for you and true for me personally. And if you're not a church person or you're not a Jesus follower, you have every right to hold us accountable to live out these behaviors, and you've got every right to call out our hypocrisy when we don't. So, here's the first behavior. Followers of the way prioritize people far from God. People who follow Jesus think about people not in church, people who don't have a relationship with God before they think about themselves. Now, it is so rare to find Christians who do this today because it's easiest to think about what we like, what we want, and what we need. I mean, the gravitational pull of every local church is to focus inward, right? To keep the people happy who are already part of the club. I mean, that's natural. It's just not biblical. When Jesus launched the church, he made it clear he was flinging open the doors to create a movement focused on people, oddly enough, who were not yet a part of the movement. Now, here's a little backstory on that. Jesus' last words to his followers before he left this earth he said to them, go into all the world and tell everybody about my resurrection. But it did not take long for the early followers of Jesus to ignore that. They stayed right where they were in Jerusalem. Nobody left, nobody moved because well, Jerusalem was comfortable. Jerusalem kept them surrounded by their Jewish people. Jerusalem was home. And while they knew what Jesus had said, what they really believed was that God didn't care about non-Jewish people. And those people couldn't really be part of the movement anyway. So finally, after about seven years of the Jewish people just slamming the door in the face of non-Jewish people, God had enough. So he orchestrated this unusual series of events to teach the church to prioritize people far from God. Here's how it happened. Uh, go to around AD 40, okay? Peter, you've heard of Peter. Peter's in the coastal town of Joppa, which is called Jaffa today, and he's staying at the home of a man named Simon the Tanner. Meanwhile, 32 miles north up the coast in the town of Caesarea, God's doing something that Peter couldn't imagine God would ever do. God is working in the life of a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. Now, a little context here is going to help you. Caesarea had been taken over by the Romans and made their capital headquarters in Israel, which meant, well, most all the Jewish people had left Caesarea if they could because they didn't want to be anywhere near these unclean, boorish conquerors for both political and spiritual reasons. They were done with them, right? So to Jews, Cornelius was clearly their enemy, which meant, based on the way they saw the world, Cornelius was God's enemy. 
But they were wrong. One day about three in the afternoon, an angel appears to Cornelius, which scares him to death, as it should have. And the angel tells him, Cornelius, God's been watching you. He knows that you want a relationship with him. So Cornelius sends some of your folks down to Joppa, have them find the home of Simon the Tanner, and bring back a man named Peter. He's going to tell you what you need to know. So Cornelius, you know, he gets two servants and a soldier. He gives them the instructions. He sends them on their way. Now, how likely do you think it is that Peter's going to accept an invitation to this Roman centurion's party? Yeah, not at all. I mean, it was considered unlawful by Jewish religious rules for a Jewish person to even enter the home of a non-Jew, much less the enemy Roman centurions. So God has to go to work convincing Peter to go. And by the time there's a knock at the door the next day, Peter knows he's got to say yes. But he has no clue why God would ever want him to go to a Roman centurion's home. So Peter grabs six of his Jewish buddies, okay? He's not about to walk into this territory alone. And off they go to Caesarea. And when they get there, Cornelius goes outside to meet Peter because he doesn't think Peter's actually going to come into his house. And Peter's probably thinking, I'm not sure I want to go into his house. Because Peter's been told his whole life that he is better he is morally superior to these non-Jewish people. So what's Peter going to do? Well, Luke, who records for us what happened, tells us, while talking with Cornelius, Peter went inside, and he found a large gathering of people. And I can't help but chuckle a little bit at this part. You've got to give Peter credit because he's there, and he knows God wants him there. But man, is Peter uncomfortable. He just can't get out of his system, so... When he walks in the house, here's what he says to all of these people. He says, you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me I shouldn't call anyone impure or unclean, so I guess I'm going to stop calling y'all names, right? So Peter goes, when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection, but may I ask why you sent for me? I just love his honesty. He can't imagine why these people would want to talk to him or why they'd want to hear about God. I mean, the idea of God loving and wanting a relationship with these Gentile people, the idea, of God, the idea that God would care about them as much as his fellow Jews, that was unbelievable. So Cornelius, he tells Peter the whole story of how, you know, angel came, God told him to send for Peter, how they want to know about Jesus, and, and Peter finally gets it. So Luke tells us that Peter, you know, quiets everybody down. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. In other words, Peter goes, we Jews never thought that God would want y'all and his family. But okay, I guess we're wrong. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And so Peter does. He tells them about Seeing Jesus, death on a cross, and then the resurrection, and how forgiveness and grace are available through Jesus. And then to Peter and his Jewish buddies, the most shocking thing happens. These non-Jewish people say, well, we want to follow Jesus. They all do. And all of Peter's Jewish buddies who came with him, they can't believe it. But you can't deny it either, right? It, it doesn't fit into their theology, into their beliefs, but it's clearly a reality. So they baptize all the people in Cornelius' home. And from that moment on, the early church began to tear down the barriers that were separating Jewish people and non-Jewish people, and more importantly, non-Jewish people and people who want a relationship with God. So they opened up the doors to people who weren't Jewish, and Peter began to fight to prioritize people far from God. So it would be simple for anybody who wanted to connect with him. But here we are 2,000 years later, and isn't it true there's still a tendency in every church to make it about insiders and outsiders, to make it difficult for people to understand who God is and how he's for them. There's still a tendency to walk away from the messes instead of walking towards them. There's still a tendency to be judgmental of other people's sins and hypocritical about my own. There's still a tendency to make everything about us and not care about people not yet here. There is still a tendency to think we Christians are better than others simply because we've experienced God's grace. Which means any church that's going to be a group of followers of the way must be a movement that is intentional about prioritizing people far from God above themselves. So, here's what I want to do. I want to give you three practical ways you can help us to be a movement that doesn't fall into this trap. 
See, Jesus and his first followers give us a roadmap for exactly how to live this out. First, Jesus leaned relationally in the direction of those he disagreed with most. And we should too. Think about it. Who do you spend most of your time with? If you're not building relationships with people who believe differently than you, then it's impossible to love the people Jesus loves. To follow Jesus' way means you spend time with people who live and think and act differently than you do. You walk across the room or the gym or the street or the classroom or the office, and you be a friend to people who are nothing like you. Second, Jesus was not concerned with guilt by association, and neither should we. See, some of you, you're way too worried about what other people will think of you if you're friends with, you know, fill in the blank, or you're seen with, you know, fill in the blank. When you're following Jesus, it doesn't matter. If you're criticized for it, that's okay. You're in good company. Jesus was too. Jesus actually had a reputation for being a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You know why? Because he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So don't be worried about guilt by association. And then third, Jesus didn't judge non-Christians for behaving like non-Christians. And we won't either. I mean, why in the world would you expect somebody who doesn't have a relationship with God to live like they do? That's just silly. You don't need to change the behavior of anyone. You just need to introduce them to Jesus. I promise, once they meet him, he will change their heart and their behaviors will naturally follow, just like ours have. See, these are the lessons that Peter and the early followers of Jesus had to learn, and they're the lessons that we're committed to learning and practicing, too. And I'll be the first to admit, we don't always get it right, and it is really easy to get distracted, and sometimes other Christians misunderstand us, you know, as we're trying to figure this out, but that's all okay, because there is too much at stake not to prioritize people far from God. Do you realize what's at stake? I mean, in the next few months, you're going to interact with people, and our church will interact with hundreds of people who don't have a relationship with God. People who've had a bad experience with a church or bad experience with a Christian, so they've given up on God. People whose marriages are strained and they're looking for help. People who are worried about their kids and they just don't know what to do. People who are fighting addictions, you know, they're about to give up hope. People who are carrying enormous guilt from past decisions and regrets and they desperately need forgiveness. Ladies who've tried for years to get their guy to church, but they've never been successful. Parents on the verge of losing their 16, 17, 18-year-old because they're so bored in church. I mean, in the next year, those are the people who are going to show up at our church, and they're the people that are going to show up in your life. And we're going to have one shot to capture their attention, to make them feel at home, to create an experience they love, to let them know they're accepted, to point them to Jesus. For those people, listen, everything's riding on whether we're willing to prioritize them above ourselves. These people are more important than any of us Christians because... Let's be honest, we're already part of God's family. We're good. But they are still searching. They, they don't know. They're still trying to figure it out. So if you're a follower of Jesus, will you put those people far from God before yourself? Will you keep caring about them more than your own preferences? Will you, will you love them even if you don't agree with them? Will you walk towards the messes and serve them? We give to create a place for them? Will you care about them enough to share this video with them or, or maybe invite them to sit with you on a Sunday in a service? Will you start praying for them? I know this, that's what love leads us to do. The closer you get to Jesus, the more passionate you will be about people who are not close to him. Followers of the way, they prioritize people far from God because our leader gave his life for those people. So let's keep it simple for them to know him.